Uh, my talk today will be about agile de development at Dronomics. Um, so let's start with talking a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Jeremy Chinquist. I'm a project manager and scrum master at Dronomics, and I was born in the United States, did my bachelor's degree there, uh, came to Vienna, and then um, completed my Magisterstudium in uh, informatic management, so computer science management. I'm also a certified Scrum Master, and I'm one of the board members of the Drupal Austria Verein, which is the club that's based in uh, Vienna, Austria, where we meet regularly and uh, talk about Drupal. Good. Uh, Drunomics is actually a Drupal uh, development partner, meaning that we uh, help other companies uh, develop their websites. We also do a lot of consulting and whatnot. We are based in Vienna. Uh, we also have an office in Linz and we do projects that are uh, large projects. We have a couple of clients where we, we do uh, a lot of our uh, weekly work for. We have some small uh, some medium clients and some small clients as well, uh, who just need things like ongoing support development, things like that, mostly support. Uh, we also have a lot of clients within the media and publishing industries, uh, but we also do education, auto industry, finance, real estate, crowdfunding. So we actually have a broad spectrum. A lot of our work deals with custom workflows. So. Today, the talk will be about Agile methodology and specifically about Drunomics, how we implement the Agile methodology. I'm going to touch on DevOps principles a little bit. Um, I'll also get into the Scrum aspect of Agile development. And then um, I'll go a little bit more in depth into the Agile methodology that we do at Drunomics and finally touching again on some of the DevOps aspects. But let's get into it. So Agile methodology, if you go to the manifesto, um, you can see that it has the most important points uh, for what Agile is. And in order to be Agile, one has to know these points. Um, point one is to deliver features, so usable features often. And that also means doing things like continuous delivery, continuous deploy, continuous integration. You always want to be moving forward, not moving backward. Um, even if that means that your feature that you are deploying is hidden somehow or only available to the internal people to be able to be tested. Um, the second point, flexible to changing requirements, you want to uh, simply listen to your stakeholders and be able to react to the needs that they have within the next iteration. Um, in a moment, we'll come to Scrum. But when you're talking about a Scrum iteration or a sprint cycle, um, you always want to be able to plan to and ahead and react to the changes that the client needs. So that's, that is part of Agile. Um, Communication is definitely one of the key points. You need to be able to talk to your stakeholders. Uh, at Dronomics, that's been one very big point that um, consistently and regularly you want to get feedback from your stakeholders because they are the ones that are going to be using the system day in and day out. And that's a key aspect to agile development in general. Um, the rest of the bullet points then, in my opinion, kind of reinforce the things at the top. Um, you need to be able to uh, create an atmosphere, your development team, which includes motivated individuals, individuals who are going to actively learn, actively reflect on their, the, on the level of their work and improve themselves because this is the way that you deliver good and valuable products, which is basically the goal of Agile itself. Good. Um, as one can definitely tell, this image is a custom image that I put in because of that whole line, but I think it shows well that there really is a jarring um, gap between what your client expects from Agile versus uh, sometimes what the manifesto says. So um, especially the 
when the client or the, the stakeholder themselves, when they have a, a predefined notion of what agile is, this makes it very important to address. Um, some, they come in and say, agile is great. It's the perfect thing. And then you always have to be a little bit careful. Okay. How did they experience it in the past? It might be that it wasn't actually agile either. So you always have to kind of look at how that, uh, comes into play. Um, I've had other clients, other people within our team who always look at it and say, oh God, um, agile, it just means basically missing your deadlines and pushing back all the work. You have to be flexible. Wrong. Um, that's obviously not the point of agile. And if they have that expectation, then you have to address that very quickly. Good. Um, the Agile methodology itself really works and complements um, DevOps and the other way around. So that's why I wanted to get into this. Um, Wolfgang Ziegler, our CTO at Dronomics, had given a talk um, at Drupal Austria in 2022 um, concerning these three principles of DevOps, which are highlighted in these books. Um, at the end of the presentation, I'll show a couple of references, but the Phoenix Project is one book um, which defined the three principle, uh, the three principles of the DevOps principles. Um, you have principles of workflow. Basically, you always want to be um, delivering and also accelerating your delivery. So you are consistently working to refine processes so that you are moving forward and accelerating. And that, of course, as I had mentioned earlier with the agile methodology, you're delivering often, you're incrementing. Uh, and so these types of things, they are simply two different words for the same thing, I feel. Um, the second one with principles of feedback Getting constant feedback as DevOps, as developers, is sometimes very difficult. Um, it's also very, you have to put yourself out there. You have to be willing to take criticism as well as willing to take uh, praise. And that's very hard for some people. Um, that's one-to-one -one with the Agile methodology. You have to listen to your stakeholders, listen to their review things, things like that. Uh, so feedback is very important. And the last one, continual learning and experimentation. Um, there's in the agile world, there's the idea of a self-organizing team. They are learning. They are also regularly, um, coming together, reviewing and also doing retrospectives. So, um, as you'll see in the next slide, that word retrospective comes up as well. Um, just the three books that Wolfgang had also highlighted in his talk, uh, these three have helped us a lot over the years to just go back to. Okay, uh, getting into Scrum itself. So Agile methodology is one aspect. Uh, Scrum is the, is one framework for developing in an Agile environment. Um, Scrum, I think you've all seen this famous graphic with its nice little features on it. Um, you have the different phases, you have the planning phase, the implementation itself, the review, and the retrospective. If you don't know what those words are, I'm not going to go into them today, but please do take a look at them because they are, it's, it's a very interesting model. Let's put it that way. Um, but you have the main actors, the product owner, You've got the scrum master, you have the entire rest of the development team. And then over here, you've got your, um, your stakeholders themselves. So they will be getting and reviewing the output. Um, so this is one way to be agile in your project. You have a list of items in your backlog. The product owner is responsible for that. The development team. Uh, will take on and commit to a sprint. So they will take on stories from the backlog and commit to them. And then they move into this cycle, one sprint cycle, and then the, the stakeholders will get the ability to look at them. So I've 
come across it so often at Dronomics that everybody understands Agile and Scrum differently. These types of things need to be addressed as well because they are not going to go away. And if you ignore them, actually, it's going to become a problem. So uh, from the get-go, I like to work with clients to set up how long they need. Uh, most of our development cycles actually go from the three week or the four week cycles. Two weeks has actually proven to be a little bit short. Um, so we tend to do three weeks for fairly large projects where we have a lot of developers in them. Um, because if you go too long, those development cycles then get to be too large with a large team. With smaller teams, we actually do four week cycles more regularly because they will meet with a client to do these major meetings like the planning and the review and the retrospective once a month. But three weeks just proves to be too short uh, with a small team. You have to adjust somehow. So that is really important to set a team, uh, set a iteration length that actually works for you. Um, two things that really need to be addressed early on and actually revisited a couple of times is what the definition of ready means and what the definition of done means. Definition of ready, is this feature or is this user story actually ready to be developed? Um, is it ready for the developers to come in and say, okay, um, we know what we're doing, let's go and do it. Um, if the definition of ready actually isn't there, a lot of the times the story or the feature will have to be put on pause, pulled out of the sprint even, and this is not the point of agile development. You want to develop it, you want to deliver it, you want to meet your sprint goals, the things that you are committing to. At Dronomics, we definitely try to be well prepared for that step so that we do not have to, at the end of the sprint, go, hmm, uh, sorry, this one couldn't get done. We're never 100% successful with that. And that's one of the things that you also have to take and reflect on at the end. Um, but the definition of ready is important. The same thing, development done. Um, sometimes I mentioned development. Uh, when the coding is finished, that is not always the definition of done. The stakeholder has to look at it. The stakeholder has to accept it. But there's a key fact before that. The product owner has to look at it and accept it. Um, so the product owner is the person who really is going to stand behind the feature that's been developed and say, hey, this is my responsibility. I looked at it. And the stakeholders then only see the things that the product owner has actually reviewed and given their okay about. So a a product owner who is a good product owner, who is talented and can stand behind those things, is also very important for any sort of agile development or um, in the agile world, this person is probably more of a, a, a management role in Scrum. It's definitely the product owner, but this person really needs to stand behind what they are doing and they have to be really near to the client so that they can actually do that. Um, the last thing I wanted to highlight was the development team size. So small teams can be very effective, but they need to have the tools in order to be able to develop. So if you're very front end heavy for the moment and you need to have, you need to interact with a lot of APIs in the back end, we've seen that sometimes you need to take on one or two additional front end developers and maybe take away one or two back end developers. So being flexible to say, okay, for for this sprint, we're very heavy in this regard. We need people to help us. Um, having the team set up and prepared is actually very key to being able to deliver in that next cycle. Um, so coming back around to it again, committing to the sprint, delivering what you need uh, becomes very important. And actually this, when the stakeholders see that you are committing to the sprint and then delivering that sprint, um, they really become comfortable with you and start to trust that system much more. And one of the key things that has come out, especially in some of the most recent projects that I've had, is being repeatable. Um, 
not only not only being able to have some sort of workflow or so for yourself, but I'll get into other things, um, having templates and whatnot. Actually, that will come. Uh, communication, as I said, very key. We tend to use certain tools like Jira or Utrack for ticketing systems, um, but we have to define user stories well. So if you don't know what user stories are, please go and look at the uh, Scrum guidelines on what user stories are. They can help you a lot. Um, we put a lot of value in the user story itself so that there is little confusion. And oftentimes they'll actually send the user story to the stakeholders and ask them, is this formulated correctly? I actually hope that the stakeholders will be able to formulate their own user stories one day. But uh, obviously, we've uh, really put a lot of value in, in getting those user stories created so that the tickets can be developed. Um, we use tools like Confluence so that I can have multiple people editing one sort of document. Um, the worst thing in a red flag for me is when a client is using email to communicate with us because email, unfortunately, does not help us. Um, some people don't read the emails. You can't go back to it. The version or the information changes. So therefore, you always want to go and be able to have one point of truth. And Confluence in the past has been a really good tool for me. Um, there are definitely other tools that work just as well, but uh, this is the one that I have most experience with. Um, and then one thing that I really like to have for deployments, especially, or for, for processes that I have to do often is to have workflows and checklists to be able to repeat things. Um, when we have a workflow, you don't have to think. When we have a workflow with a checklist, um, you can see which steps actually had a problem and ones you need to address later on. So we constantly do reviews of our deploys too. Um, continuous integration is something that we at Drewnomics value highly. Uh, all of our projects have some sort of pipeline, build pipeline, so that we can see where something's going wrong or things are going right. So in this graphic here, you can see that we have several different steps with check uh, checkboxes, things are green. We don't just do this for the code that we're going to deploy, but when we start to develop a new feature, we will create a, a Git branch um, within the project itself. And then the branch the, with the new feature will actually go through all of these steps as well. So we can see if something is breaking or not. Um, it's in essence, we're getting a copy of the website, a very reduced copy, but we're able to then test things. And we can also pass it on to the product owner to test. Yeah. Uh, at Dronomics, we tend to use GitHub Actions a lot. We've used other tools in the past, but um, in essence, what you need to do is ensure that you have some sort of repeatable process. So GitHub Actions is definitely something I'd recommend. Ticket management. Um, it has been very helpful for us to maintain kind of a strict uh, ticketing format. Um, so at the beginning, you have epics, classic features that you want to have made, things that you can actually con uh, close, del deliver and close. Um, the epics themselves are broken down into a collection of stories, or sometimes they're even just user stories. Um, as a journalist, I want to update and edit and edit an article, things like that. Um, the stories then, once they've been committed to and taken into a sprint, or even before that, the developers will then start, start to take them on as tasks. Uh, at least this is what we do at Dronomics. You break it down into tasks, and then the backend people get this, the frontend people get this, the uh, the testers get this information, and then they have different tasks that they can fulfill. Um, 
But in essence, what we do is we deliver them the story to the product owner, and this is our increment, and then the story itself will get passed on to the stakeholders to test. Uh, in the past, managing dependencies has been key. Um, if you have one feature that is blocked by some other feature that is not developed yet or not there, obviously you're not going to be able to develop it then within the sprint, or it's going to be very difficult. So look at your, have, have your product owner look at the dependencies. Do they, does the developer actually do the, does everybody have the stuff that they need in order to be able to develop this? If there's something blocking you, that should be a red flag and you should not commit to pulling it into the sprint until you've actually gotten rid of the blockers. Or you have to, rearrange the tickets, uh, redefine them so that you can actually develop them. That's another option. I like to work with ticket templates a lot. So if the stakeholders and if the developers both know how a ticket is formulated, uh, how the story is actually described, they can then much more easily go in and take a look and see if something is problematic, if something is meeting their expectations or not meeting their expectations. And so ticket templates simply help to just normalize these things and everybody feels comfortable and happy. Um, yeah, and I cannot stress this enough. The product owner has to be the one responsible for what's delivered to the stakeholders. Um, if you do not have a product owner who stands behind it, the development team can be the best team in the world. You're not going to get any farther. It's, you have to have a product owner who is willing to stand behind the development team and say basically, Hey, I've looked at this. I've reviewed it. Um, this is ready to be presented or it's not ready to be presented. The person has to be also very honest with the development team. Um, at Dronomics, we always define a product owner proxy as well. So somebody who's closer to the development team and that person usually ends up being me. Uh, it's somebody who can just step in as the product owner if the product owner is out, who is constantly in exchange with the product owner and helping that person out. Um, so I know that some people will criticize me about this because it's not exactly Scrum. But people go on vacation, people get sick, so you need these kind of backups. And so that's why we do this product owner pro proxy. And I've heard it mentioned by a couple of different companies, so it's not anything new that we've invented, but it's definitely something that has helped us out in the past. Uh, a few more just kind of off-topic things. Finding a balance is also very important. Uh, I, I've never had a project follow the Scrum method or the Agile method 100%. Not going to happen. Uh, I wish it would, but I challenge somebody to actually find a working project that is 100% fulfilling this uh, Scrum methodology. Um, you have to make some compromises where needed. Obviously, you don't want to make too many compromises because then you start to go outside of this agile world. Um, and ticket states themselves is one thing that I'm very particular about. Um, I, I believe you've seen, you've all seen this where you look at a, some sort of ticket or something to be developed and a tester has written a comment, um, on number comment number 79 in the ticket. And you have to read all of those in order to be able to figure out what you actually want to develop or where the ticket is supposed to go. Don't do that. <laughs> the, the, the comment thread is exactly there to leave comments to see what's happening, but you really have to update then the ticket itself if you are going to know where that ticket should go. So the assignee should, is really important. The ticket state is very important. You always want it to be able to be moved. Um, so one of the things that a couple of key, key people at Dronomics keep mentioning is, well, um, 
what is the next step to do for this ticket? And when the developer tells me, um, actually that should be this and this, and then you, my answer immediately is, well, okay, why isn't that in the description of the ticket of what needs to happen next? Um, so we consistently try to do this summary update in the ticket and get that moving. Um, one other thing that comes up constantly is being able to interpret what the stakeholder wants. Sometimes that's a good idea because the stakeholder really has a problem describing what they want and you, you really, from your practice, you know this, you know what they want. But um, if, if there's any doubt, phrase it how you think it should be phrased, phrase the user story, and then go back to the stakeholder and get their approval before you actually start to develop because otherwise you might be developing in a completely wrong direction. Um, for something small, it doesn't matter, but for something large, obviously, you don't want to be at the other end at the end of the day where somebody says, well, actually, what have you developed for two weeks? And it's a bad thing. Um, a couple of last minute ideas for the DevOps. Um, as I've said a couple of times, you have to be able to stand behind what you actually deliver. Um, so the DevOps principles also says you want to continually learn, continually expand. That goes hand in hand with the agile methodology. Uh, blameless postmortems are very important. Uh, you can certainly review things uh, in private with the developer, for example, if they need to improve themselves personally or if they are having problems. But uh, in the retrospective meeting or in the in a meeting where you're talking about just what happened in the last sprint, you want to make that a blameless atmosphere so that you can really identify the problems. And this separation is sometimes very difficult. And it, if it doesn't work, <clears throat> Somebody has to step in and just simply say, hey, okay, let's, we have to break this up. We have to stop this because it's not good for the, the development team and then revisit it. In my opinion, a scrum master who is good will be the person who steps in and says, okay, um, this is a problem point. We need to break it off and go back and look. Blamelessness in that regards is very important so that you can move forward. <clears throat> Um, one of the DevOps principles is converting your tacit knowledge into explicit and you can then continually review and improve and make it your expertise. So we have, for example, done several projects with uh, integrating solar searching, uh, the solar search service. Uh, to the point where we've built up a knowledge base where we've then also made things reproducible and we can do it again. So here's a list of resources that I've actually used today. Um, please go ahead and look them up yourself. And I thank you very much for the opportunity to give you this talk. <laughs>